I'm Apostle T.B. Walker, and I want to welcome you once again to Disciples of Faith Global Outreach, where we are, we are reaching the world one share at a time. I'm so glad to have you here with us today. We've been doing a great, great study uh, on, in Genesis, and we're talking about the beginning, where we come from, the origins of the story. And you know, one of the great things about this book of Genesis, as we enter into this study, and as we look at what God has to reveal to us today, one of the things we find out about this particular study is that it genders so many questions. It's why. is really, really a major question. Why would God allow to happen what happens in Genesis? You know, as we look back and we look at this pandemic uh, that we're going through, you know, everything that we're, we're going through right now, as we look at what's going on with uh, many, many leaders in the world, as we look at plagues and famines that are in our uh, on our planet, as we look at global warming, as we look at uh, injustice, racism, you know, as we look at insurrection, as we look at everything that's going on, one of the interesting things about this is that our desire is to find some way to trace this back to like, where did this begin? Where did this hatred begin? And, you know, when we do our historical studies, we get back into, into history and we find out that certain struggles began in, you know, in the, in the 13th century. And this happened in the 11th century. But the truth of the matter is, we still have to go back even further to really understand the origins of the issues and the problems that we're having right now. Uh, and they all originate from this one action of our first parents, the action of eating of the fruit, of disobeying God, and every catastrophe that we have, every disease that you can imagine, everything that you look at that just blows your mind, that, you know, man, how could the human body turn on itself like that? How in the world could people turn on each other like that? As we hear the news, we're just continually moved more and more to exasperation by what we see. And the only way we can really, really understand it is to go back to the beginning to really understand where it began. But the great news in this is that there is a solution that is right there along with the problem. That, that in the midst of this, this is not something that is outside of the plan of God, not something that is so far outside of the wheelhouse and the power and authority of God that it's just spiraling out of control. And, you know, that even God is surprised. Absolutely not. There's a plan within a plan. There are things that are being revealed. And I'm so glad that you're here with us today because there's some things that we want to reveal here that God has given me revelation to reveal these things to you. So I'm so happy that you're here. So happy that those that are already on, those that are going to be coming on, I'm excited about what God is going to do. I'm so glad that you're here supporting Disciples of Faith Global Outreach. We are reaching the world one share at a time, and I want you to help us once again by sharing the video. Listen, I wouldn't mind if you went ahead and shared it right now. If you just press the share button and just stay on because there's so much more, but I want your friends to be able to hear what God is doing. I want those people that are connected to you, whether they're really, really your friends or just people you accepted as your friends, listen, there's no better, better gift to your friends than to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're ministering today, the gospel. We're going to be looking today in the book of Genesis, chapter number three. I'm going to start at verse number 14. I'm going to end at verse number 15. I'm reading out of the NLT today, and I'm going to read this in your hearing. Hi, Mom. Uh, I want to give this to you today, and, um, and I think it's really going to be important because there's some revelation that we need to understand concerning Christ as we are looking at things and wondering why, how, even assigning blame. I want you to begin to really understand that God is in control and that, listen, if there's anyone that you're pointing your finger at, it's really him. But if you understand who you're pointing your finger at, you'll get excited and recognize, God, I may not understand all that you're doing, but what you're doing is designed to work together for my good. So let's read. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you for your people that are assembled here to hear it. God, we bless you right now that we know there's not an accident or happenstance that they're here, but it's by divine decree and design that each and every person is coming online to hear. God, not only those that are going to hear today, but even down the line that are going to uh, hear what you're saying today. God, we pray right now that this word will be covered, 
that you would send it out protected and guided and send it directly to whom it was designed for. God, we bless you right now that I am simply a sower that is sowing seed in all places, but God, believing that within in the midst of this, under the sound of my voice, there is good ground that is going to bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some, some 100 fold. God, we believe you today in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at verse number 14. So it says, uh, we start here, we recognize that there has been a fall, that Eve and Adam have uh, both eaten of the fruit that God had told them not to eat of. They are now in a, in a shamed spot. They're hiding and they're talking to God outside of his presence. They're afraid to even get into the presence of God. They are now trying to cover themselves by whatever means they possibly can. Their own feeble imaginations are allowing them to, to make leaves for themselves to try to cover themselves from an omnipotent, omniscient God. How foolish is that? But then here's what the Lord says. The Lord then begins to come to Adam and he asks him, you know, what have you done? He begins to talk to the woman. He asks her, what have you done? Uh, and, and Adam begins to say, it's the woman that you gave me. The woman says, well, listen, I, I, I admit I did eat, but it was Satan. The serpent has beguiled me. It was the serpent who deceived me, gave me this information that was faulty. I thought that he was right. I thought that he was someone to be followed. Turns out that he was wrong and someone not to be followed. I should have fled from him, but I I, I was led by him. And instead, I, I, I disobeyed the commandment that you gave me and I ate. And the Lord now turns his attention to the serpent. And, and, and now he says to the serpent, he says, um, and this is literally the serpent. This is to the actual serpent, but it's also to the spirit that's inside the serpent. There, you know, there is one here. There is a serpent, but yet that there is a spirit that has inhabited the serpent. Now, when you begin to look at this, the serpent is a tempter here. He's the instrument that's used here, and he stands here without any excuse. That, that we recognize that the serpent here is not the snake that we know, but the serpent is a being with abilities that, that, that snakes don't have today. The serpent obviously is in a position where he is not necessarily slithering on the ground as we know him. But the serpent has the ability here even to speak. And Satan here is in the midst of this using now this very serpent. And so as God begins to talk to the serpent, he's now do dealing with the duality of the serpent. He's dealing with the serpent himself, but also the tempter, the spirit that's also there. Both of them are punished, the serpent being the instrument that is being used. And he is cursed here for Satan's sake because of him being used by Satan. And also, and note here that the Lord doesn't ask the serpent any questions. He doesn't come here to try to get the serpent to make a confession. He doesn't bring any revelation to the serpent because he knows the serpent is a liar. And the moment that he begins to deal with the serpent, he pronounces judgment. He does not offer grace at all. He does not bring the serpent to a reality. He's not hoping that the serpent is going to somehow give him the truth. Absolutely not. He takes no pains here to begin to convince Satan of his own sin because the reality is he doesn't reason with him. He's not debating with him. He's not trying to bring him around. He knows that Satan is a hardened apostate spirit that is already doomed to everlasting destruction. So, and he is without any hope, without any hope of mercy. He's already set up for destruction. There is no forgiveness. So he pronounces a curse on the serpent. Now the serpent has a curse that is temporal. But the curse that is pronounced in Satan is eternal. Now, once you begin to look at this, there's a lack of revelation here. And that lack of revelation is important. The fact that God doesn't reveal the, the sin, the fact that God doesn't want the sin to bubble to the top, the, the fact that he's not trying to remove it shows the divine resentment that he has for the crime that's been committed. He's not here fixing anything. He's only here for judgment. He says, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all the animals, domestic and wild. Because you beguiled the woman, because you came and directly tried to distort the plan of God, he pronounces a curse and he says, you're cursed above. Now note this, he's going to curse the earth and not curse the man or the woman. He's going to curse the earth for their sake. But he says, you are cursed above all the other animals, tame 
and domestic. Those that are designed to serve man, you're cursed above them. Those that are wild and out in the wild, you're cursed above them. And he says, and this word curse is only used as for the original tempter. He says, you're cursed like Satan here. You're cursed like the ground here. This is the sphere that man is going to dwell, and you're cursed there. Now, note this. The serpent here now becomes the most hateful of all creatures. That, that It's almost an ape that people can't stand snakes. They're, they're the most detestable to men. And, and God here, is, 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 note here, he's a curse to men, but Satan is a curse to God. That God here has banished him from his divine presence. The, Jesus mentioned, he said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like a lightning bolt. He is in everlasting chains reserved for judgment. That there's a fire uh, in the lake of fire that's reserved for, uh, and it's an everlasting fire that's reserved for Satan and his angels. This is the peril that Satan now is dealing with. And he says, you're going to crawl, growling in the dust, and as long as you shall live. So now I want you to get, it, to get this, because when you begin to look at this, you see the original difference. You see exactly what's happened to the serpent. That obviously, this was not his mode of locomotion before this. This was not the way he appeared before this. His progression and the way he operated was totally different. But now he's going to operate in a crawling motion. And he's going to, because he's now going to be in the ground, if you look at any snakes, that their tongue has a connection to the dust that's there. And you'll see here that this curse that's pronounced, it, 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 because he says, because of your temptation, you became a snake. He wasn't a snake, but he became a snake. As a result of the judgment that God placed on him, he now has to walk away slithering into the bush. And I want you to get this. He's going to lose all his glory. That, that's one of the things that happens here. The Lord says, Whatever, whatever glory you thought you had, you're going to lose it. You're going to grovel in the dust. You're going to find great difficulty in movement. And when you begin to look at this, this punishment that is here for the serpent is not just there for the serpent, but it's also there for Satan. Satan, who as the Bible tells us was beautiful, had his own place in heaven, was a leader even among heaven, is being cast down. He says, your glory is being taken from you. Whatever shroud of glory you had is going to be lost. You, you're no longer going to eat angel food. But now the only power that Satan has in, is in the feeble morality of man. That's all that's there. So note this, the serpent is a type. But the diabolical nature inside the serpent is what God is after. The serpent's punishment is temporal. He's a snake in the earth, but Satan's is eternal. And I want you to get this. This is the condition that God is looking at. This is the condition that he's saying the serpent and Satan are going to be in. They won a victory over these innocent uh, uh, first parents, right? They, 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 and, and guess what? That victory that Satan won that first time, he's still slithering and, and winding his way through humanity, through our lives, even today, trying to continue to bite people and to bring them deeper and deeper into this morass, into this abyss of sin. And when you look at this, I want you to see what sin does. Because the first thing you'll begin to see is that whatever noble bearing that was there, sin is going to take it away. Sin is designed to actually cause nobility and glory to go. It's designed for that. So when you begin to look at that, I want you to see something happening here that is major. Hold on for just one second. I had to get something to drink. Now, I want you to look at this. Now, now, now Satan tempted Eve, right? And, and he, was a, he was a now a low groveling creature. Now, Satan is now despicable. And, 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 and he's a spirit that is a liar. And God now begins to give them, he begins to talk to them and begins to show us now the nature that we're going to see in our lifetime from this point on. He now begins to put something between the man and the woman. He now, God's answer here was not cursing the man. God's answer here was not cursing 
the woman. God's answer now was war. There was now going to be war that was going on. And God was going to even begin to use something here that is dynamic to bring about this war. That when I talk about war, God was actually talking about victory. He says, I'm going to cause hostility between you and the woman. Now, understand this. This is a causation by God, that God is now saying that this hostility that you feel, that even the war we go on against Satan today, that God says, I caused that, that listen, I'm the one that's going to wake you up to who he is. The Lord says, I won't let you be ignorant of any of Satan's devices. So when you begin to understand these devices, one of the things you'll understand is that God is saying, I'm stirring you up to war against a spirit that you didn't understand before. Now you are no longer like that innocent baby. He says, I'm going to cause hostility. Finally, at the end of this, now the serpent now has been cursed. Satan has now been called out. Satan now has also been cursed. God now has already said, your glory days are over. You had one victory and you're going to be deluded into thinking that it's all over, that the truth of the matter is that you are won, you've won. You're already hoisting up the victory flag, but God is now beginning to reveal the plan of redemption. He's revealing the plan of redemption to man, but I like this because he's, re he's revealing the plan of redemption to Satan. He's revealing the plan of redemption to the serpent. Then, you know, oftentimes we think that, you know, they, they get away with it. Somebody got away with anything. Adam and Eve are spectators right now. Eve, I've already dealt with you. You over here. Adam, I've already dealt with you. You're over here. Now I'm dealing with Satan. You think you're a winner, but you're a liar. You think you've had victory, but you're a loser. Here's what I'm going to do. The same people that you thought were nothing, that were small and easy to whoop. Matter of fact, not even Adam. You thought it was Eve. He says, I'm going to cause hostility. You don't even know what's in her. You have no idea what's in her. Listen, there's a great revelation that's about to come. He says, I'm going to put enmity, but not enmity between Eve and serpent. I'm going to put that between, and here's what he says, between you and the woman. That means every other woman that comes is going to be equipped with hostility against you. He says, there's going to be perpetual hostility. She is the birth. Her name is Eve because she is the mother. So I'm going to do something with mothers. Listen, that's one of the reasons why mothers are so powerful in protecting the seed, even in a way that the father is not. God says that because there's a hostility against anything that will try to destroy the seed, there's a protective nature over the seed. And even the seed, there's a protective nature over the word. You got to look at this moment right here where Adam and Eve are on the sidelines looking at this whole scene. And one of the things that you'll see with them is that they've got to be terrified. They are now seeing a serpent that they spoke with and, and talked to that was glorious and so powerful that he was able to tempt them. His visage was more beautiful. His cunningness had beguiled them. And yet now he has shrunk so low right in their face. And, and, and now he has become a snake. He was not a serpent. He has been transformed. His glory has been stripped from him. His place has been stripped. And he who was above all the other animals in their eyes now is below all of creation. And now he's a slithering, hissing thing. Listen, that's what sin will do. But God knows how to put it right in your face for you to be able to say, there but by the grace of God go I. They were probably wondering, listen, we're seeing grace happen right now. It could be you. Matter of fact, it should be you, but I didn't curse you. I cursed something else instead. You deserved it. And listen, we're not, we're seeing from the very beginning blood being shed, people being changed, and yet the man being clothed in that blood. It is the, the animal when, when they're trying to cover themselves, God kills something, but he doesn't kill Adam. He doesn't kill Eve. He begins to cover them with that blood that is there. And when he begins the cursing process, he curses the earth and he curses the serpent and he curses Satan, but he does not curse the man because he's got a plan for the man. And see, there's a friendship here. 
I want you to begin to see this, that, that there's a friendship here that Adam and Eve had with the serpent that God is first breaking. Before you can come back, you got to break that relationship that you had with him. Listen, the reality is that the Lord is not saying you can't come back, honey. He's simply saying you got to cut that thing off first. One of the things that people think they can do is drag their mess back into the presence of God. One of the things you've got to understand that God said, I'm welcoming you home, but you got to cut that off. The prodigal son has got to stop eating with the hogs and, and in order for him to come on back home because home is outside of hog territory so the lord is saying listen adam eve i want you back but i need you to see who you followed listen i want you back but i need you to clearly see so you'll never go back to him again i need you to see the bum you left me for i need you to really see the deadbeat you left me for you see him now slithering on the ground you thought he was a boss before right you thought he was really something look at him now just at my word i can transform him from something into nothing just because i said it i spoke a curse and then all of a sudden he transformed transformed right in front of you. Aren't you glad that I showed you who he really is before you got too deep into that relationship with your Satan? See, listen, I want you to understand that that's exactly what God is doing today. He's breaking our relationships with false teachers. He's breaking our relationship with tradition. He's breaking our relationship and saying, you can't come back to the truth until you let that tradition go. There's no way you'll be able to come back to the truth and understand the liberty and the love that I have until you get back and recognize that is not greener pastures. That's a prison cell. You were in bondage. I know you were dancing over there thinking you had gotten over, but did it really make you wise? Were you? Are you really like me? I mean, it was, was it really good for food or did it just turn your whole world upside down? And what I just did to him, I could do to you, but instead of that, I'm going to bless you when I could be messing you up. There is a natural fear now that God begins to put in the heart of the woman and the man for the snake as well as for Satan. We can't be friends anymore. Listen, in spite of this beauty and in spite of the gracefulness of a snake, no matter how beautiful they look, they've been adorned in all kinds of colors, stripes, and, and all kinds of patterns, and yet folks still are looking and saying, get that snake out the room. Uh, listen, a fluorescent bird I can handle. Give me even another lizard I can handle. A fish in all its scales, put the light on it, and it's beautiful. But get that snake out the room. I don't care how beautiful a rainbow boa is. I don't want to touch it. I don't want them around my neck. Yes, there's certain species, there's certain types of people that like snakes, but on a whole, folks are on the lookout for snakes. There's no, they, we don't have any signs that say you with a little zero around it and say no cats, no dogs. No, no, no. We, no, no. We don't want, there's no, no giraffes, but there's some no snakes. We don't want snakes. So when you begin to look at this, there's an innate loathing. God has said, I first I'm going to put in it. Because in order for God to put in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure, he also first puts in you a, a desire to hate sin. One of the things that Job did when, when the Lord says, he's this is a perfect man because he eschewed evil. That, that means he didn't just try to stay away from it. He despised it like it was a snake. And so the Lord says, I'm going to put a perpetual enmity between the woman and as well as the, the, the serpent. And he says, and between your offspring and her offspring, between her seed and your seed. And the seed here can be used in the singular form. The, the seed here, when we begin to look at the, in the singular, it, it is dealing with one. And this one, now there's seeds all the way through because in order to get to the one seed, the other seeds have got to be protected. In order to get to the, the seed, the holy seed, the seed of Abraham, we've got to protect Abraham. There's got to be a protection of Moses. There's got to be a protection of Jacob. There's got to be a protection of Isaac. So all throughout the, all throughout the line, the seed has been protected to make sure that the seed, the holy seed, the seed of the woman that he's talking about, there is one seed here that, that, that's got to be protected because he says, I'm going to put enmity between you and your seed and, and the seed of the woman. Now, this is the whole sum of the matter of the whole Bible. Listen, if you can understand Genesis 3.15, you understand everything. Everything that is in this word right now deals with the struggle of 
humanity. This is the person who waged it. It is telling us who is actually in this war, the manner of the war, and the consequences of sin, but also the victory and the plan. We learned the end of it. What we have right now is that this is just being worked out right in front of us. And that's exactly what's happened. It's showing us right now. Not man in this, this distant relationship from God, but it's showing this close, loving relationship and a personal relationship, a personal covenant relationship that he has with man. Listen, Adam has not said, I'm sorry. Eve has not taken accountability. Yet the friendship and grace has already entered into the picture where God is protecting people that have not even owned up to their sin, that are not yet worshiping him, that, that are not treating him as if he is God. And yet the great love story is, I kept my end of the bargain and even when you didn't keep yours. I want, I want you to get that. Listen, you know what? I, the, the, our New Year's, if you look at New Year's Day, the believer's New Year is not January 1st. The truth of the matter is the believer's New Year is actually uh, Easter. You know, the, the New Year and resolutions, and when we begin to look at what happened in the year, in, secular, in a secular realm, we recognize that, you know, you live from January 1st, you live one year to the next. But when the believer begins to really look at the New Year and begins to look at resolutions, it's usually at Easter. It's Easter when you begin to realize the great covenant that Christ has really made with us, the sacrifice that he really made with his life. And when you begin to realize how you lived that whole year, th that you didn't live up to the covenant, and yet the death still happened. That you didn't live worthy of the blood, and yet the blood was still shed. That's our new year. That's the one we look and say, why would you do this? And the reality is that God would say, I instituted this bleeding before you were ever born. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Listen, there was a plan here. This is a, this is a relationship that God is saying, I am keeping the covenant. I knew you wouldn't. God, why would you allow this to happen if you knew? Listen, I want you to begin to look at this. God is trying to show us his plan. He's revealing here the intimate thought. This is a thriller better than any thriller. This is a plan within a plan. This is stuff that you look and say, wow, I never thought about that. He says, let me tell you what's going to happen. He's going to strike your head and you will strike his heel. Now, here's what the Lord is saying. Man is going to eventually prevail, but he's not going to get away unscathed. The, 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 the snake, the adder, the, the, uh, you know, uh, the, the death adder, the puff adder, the, the, whatever, the, the rattlesnake, whatever this poisonous viper that you can see. He says, listen, this viper is going to die when you, you're going to step on it. But like, you know how snake bites happen? They happen in that very same way. They happen because people have accidentally stepped on a cobra. That's how they happen in Africa. That's how they happen in India. They're, they're happening because people are trampling, they're, you know, habitat loss. And so as people are in those snakes' habitats, they accidentally step on a snake and they get bitten. Now, here's what happens. You can, the snake can actually get trampled and crushed under the foot, but not without first biting the, the person. So when you begin to look at this, this looks like a death sentence here. If, you know, you're going to bite him, but he's going to bite you. But this is not going to be a victory that's going to happen by mere strength. This is the seed. There, there is a seed that can die, but there is the seed of the woman that spoke about that is the holy seed. That this, it, this is this the deliverer that's going to come on, on the scene. This is what everything is about. We leave out these words right here. Th these words right here that says, and this is what's going to happen. This is a river that just keeps flowing without any end. It has no beaches. That there, there's no way to get there. These scriptures right here are everything that the scripture is all about. And what we find out here is that this is not necessarily just about the fall. We kind of think that this is Genesis chapter 3 is about the fall of man. No, this is the introduction of restoration. See, listen, the plan that God has here is that you can't have restoration without falling. Falling requires restoration. Here's what's powerful. From the very beginning, right, from the very beginning, grace enters in. Grace is entering into this place. Somebody asked the question during our Bible study, it, you know, and they said, is this the place where grace actually enters in? Look at what God does. He prophesies the doom of Satan at the very first showing of Satan's victory. And he says, the battle is not between Satan and even and the man, but the battles between Satan and the seed of the woman. Grace is not an afterthought here. 
it enters into the world side by side with sin. And I want you to get that. And this is the cornerstone of everything we believe. Everything that we see here is based upon this very same thing. And there's an inner meaning that we might miss. Listen, for God to actually see Satan's defeat. Here's what the Lord saw. Here's what we see. Satan has beaten Eve. God comes in the garden. They're cowering over here. And God walks in and he says, this is exactly what I have planned. This is, this is perfect. I see victory. They're in, the, they're, they're in the woods because they're trying, they're, they're, they've already seen defeat. Satan is over there just clapping his hands because he sees victory. And God says, I see you defeated. And I see you, Adam, victorious. How can this be? It means God knew something all along. This is, God's plan was not defeated when Adam and Eve were defeated. I need you to get this. God's plan was never to literally reveal as the crowning glory to the world an innocent man. God's plan was to bring about someone greater than the innocent man. God's crowning glory of all creation was much more than the innocent man. We have now the redeemed man. Listen, I want you to get this. Adam was not the end of all creation. God said it's good. And he stopped creating on the sixth day, yet he was not the end of the creation revelation. When Adam is created and everything is good, we know that inside of Adam is a woman, right? And so creation now looks complete when the woman is taken out of Adam. So Adam is the box. Like, if you've ever seen that box, that, 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 those boxes on one of those game shows, and then they can, there's, there's a huge box in this gift box, and then they reach inside the box, and there's another box inside that box. You know, and so when you look at Adam, Adam is the box. Who knew that inside of Adam was a cure for his loneliness? It was inside of him. The Lord said, it's not good that man is alone. So inside the box, he pulls out another box and says, there it is. It's all complete. Everything's perfect. Well, how can it be God? Because Satan comes in and in form of a serpent, and look what he does. And, and he comes in and God says, no, 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 no. You, you, you're missing the revelation. Inside of her is another box. She has seed inside of her. And the plan was never to just reveal Adam. The plan was never just to reveal Eve. But inside of Eve was redeemed man, waiting as a remedy for fallen man. Listen, I want you to see what God did. Inside of Adam was his remedy. Inside of you, filled with the Holy Ghost right now, is your remedy. It's inside of you. We're looking outside for everything we need. We're looking for promotion from people. We're looking for, for people to adore us. We're looking for people to validate us. And God is saying, look at how I operate. It's inside of you. And there is a, there is a power inside of you that is meant to come out of you and stand right next to you and reveal itself. And that is who you really are. Adam was not fully revealed until Eve came out. And Eve and Adam were not fully revealed until the redeemed man comes out. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Redeemed man, who is greater than innocent man, is only possible if something needs to be redeemed. God, did Satan come and mess up your plan? Absolutely not. This was a part of the plan. Listen, I, I always go back to this, so I'm, I'm going to continue to go here. I, you know, I watch so many uh, nature shows, and I, I mean, so many nature shows, and, and I'll catch them in different spots. Parts. And, you know, I, I was watching this nature show and this was in some Asiatic country. I can't I don't remember the exact uh, name of the country, so I don't want to give it. But it was an Asiatic country and these were sheep herders and they had a problem with wolves. And one of the things that they would do, they had uh, they were falconers and they would send out their falcons and the falcons were these were big birds and they could chase off the wolves. They could take sometimes and kill some coyotes, but they were too small to kill the wolves. And so what the, uh, some of the sheep herders would do, they got this, uh, this, this potent, it, it turned out to be poison, basically, uh, from a plant, and they would rub it on the, the heels and, and, the, and the haunches of the sheep. 
and uh, because the sheep would nuz nuzzle each other's faces, but they didn't nuzzle generally uh, the backsides of each other's bodies. It just wasn't the nature of the sheep. They they didn't the 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 feet. They the sheep never really put their faces down by the other uh, sheep's legs or their feet. So they were fine from the poison. But because of the nature of the wolves and the coyotes and the way that they would kill the sheep is that to get in, they would nip first at their heels. They would nip at their haunches. And so whenever, and, and they would put out these awesome looking sheep. You would kind of think they would put out the, like the worst sheep, but they put out their best sheep out there. These, these, these fat sheep and with this, this, this poison. And whenever the, the wolves would come in and they would begin to nip at the heels to try to get the sheep because the sheep are moving. They would get the poison in their mouth. And they showed, like, the next day that, uh, like, there would be sheep. Or there would be coyotes. Or there would be wolves that they would go out and track. And you could see the tracks. And then the sheep were dead. I mean, these wolves were dead because the poison got them. And, you know, one of the things that the guy who was doing the filming and everything, they were talking about the idea of using such good sheep. And the guy said to them, and, you know, in his language, and they translated, he says that his goal was not to keep the sheep. His goal was to kill the wolves. You know, the interesting thing about this is that it was a trap. The, the reality is that the wolf thought that he had gotten the sheep and didn't realize that inside on the sheep was poison that was poison to the wolf. So when you begin to look at this, we have a sacrificial lamb. The, the goal was to, to, to destroy the works of the devil. The Lord said, that's why I've come, not to save myself. The best sheep that he has, the best that the Lord had in his whole flock, he ties out there on a tree, just waiting for the wolf to come. And the wolf nips at his heels just as it was prophesied, and the trap is sprung, sprung because on the, the sheep, this one lamb, this precious lamb, the righteousness and the glory that is in him is poison to Satan. Satan couldn't handle it, and that first bite, that he, that he took, that he thought killed him, actually destroyed him. It killed him. This trap was sprung. Listen, the heel, and, and once, you, once you look at this, the heel is within Satan's reach. The arms were not in Satan's reach. Do you know that in order for this trap to work, Jesus has to take on humanity and put himself within reach of the serpent? That's a sacrifice. It isn't like, and this is just going to happen. Listen, it just happens in Africa. It just happens in India. Listen, it just happens in the Mojave Desert in America. You go out to Arizona, you can just happen to step upon a snake. And I guarantee you, you'll wish you never did. If you understand the types of the neurotoxins and the type of hemotoxins and the various things that snake poison can do, or it's actually snake venom, because being poison and being venomous is totally different, but we'll get into that later uh, at another time. But, but if you got into that venom and that venom got you, you would wish that you hadn't. The beauty of the gospel story is that you have a person who put their foot down by the snake so that they could be bitten and so the snake could be destroyed once and for all. He will bruise me. I won't, we won't get out of this without pain. It just won't be your pain. Listen. Adam sinned, Eve sinned. The Lord didn't say, and you're gonna be bruised by Satan. He says, I'm gonna bring redeemed man to take the snake bite that you can never take. You would just nip by him. He didn't totally poison you. He's gonna to totally poison him. He's gonna completely envenomate him. I'm gonna let him totally do everything that he was meant to do with you. You know Satan comes to kill, still and destroy, and you're not destroyed yet. You, you realize that, but I'm gonna allow him to be destroyed for your sake. And that bruise is going to be painful. That he's going to be betrayed by people. He says he's going to bruise your heel. He, he's going to be accused. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be buffeted. He's going to be scourged. He's going to be spit upon. He's going to be outcast. He's going to eventually be nailed to a cross just for your sake. He's going to have fever. He's going to thirst. He's going to operate in darkness and isolation. And all of this for one purpose, to bring you out of the darkness into light. What a wonderful love story when you understand what's being spoken here where God is saying, all of these things are going to happen around you. And yeah, you're going to pay a price. Childbirth is going to be really, really hard. You're going to have to work and, and to bring forth food from the ground. But you who should be cursed 
I have a plan to bless you through redeemed man. And listen, redeemed man being Jesus Christ has come. And in that great redemption, he's offered that redemption to the world. And listen, here's the sad thing. The whole world won't take it. The whole world is not going to want it. But there are those that are drawn, those sons of Adam, who des desire no longer to be sons of Adam, but want to be sons of the Lord, want to be sons of Christ, want to be made in the, his image, want to, be, uh, want to make over that Adam himself, who would see this day the sons of men, that there's this great seed of the woman. Do you know that Adam looked at his own visage and asked the very same thing, make me over. Abraham saw himself and said, make me over. That, that Peter looked and said, I am a wretch undone, make me over. And do you know every believer that has ever looked at himself and recognized, I only see Adam. I want to see you in me. Have asked, make me over. This is a love story today. This is, this is a love story. This is a, this is a triumphant story. This is for those that are all, off in the dark, trying to worship over there and don't realize that God is saying, I've already done the work so you can come out of darkness into the marvelous light. You can come back, Adam. You can come on back and be who you're supposed to be. Everything has changed. There's some physical things that are going to happen. Everything's changed. Listen, the reality is that you'll never be like you were, but there's a plan and a promise that there's going to be a day of redemption. And receiving the redeemed man is the way to get there. Death to the innocent man. Death to the knowledgeable man. And life to the redeemed man. Because he who was inside the seat of a woman, God came out. This is an awesome plan. And I want you to begin to see this. That in this plan, God didn't fail. Satan sprung the trap to bring forth redeemed man. To bring forth Christ. Adam was never the one. He was never going to be the one. It was always in Christ. The great revelation is in Genesis chapter 3. It is not as in, in Genesis chapter 1. The great revelation that Christ, that God has in store for us was never in man. It was never in the moon. It was never in the stars. The sun is awesome, but it was never in the S-U-N. It was always in the S-O-N. The great revelation was in these words that he spoke. The seed of the woman. He's the one fit for this battle. And listen, whatever you're going through right now that you're trying to fight by yourself, the Lord has simply said, I've sent one to fight for you. Don't let your ego get in the way. Don't let your, your, your mindset get in the way. Don't let your gladiatorial thinking get in the way. Yield like Adam and Eve where God is simply saying, you see yourself groveling on the ground? Listen, I blessed you instead of cursed you. Your sin is meant to be groveling like a little snake on the ground. Those enemies are meant to be groveling like a snake on the ground. Satan is the one banished so that you can walk in freeness and life. And that can't happen unless you receive Jesus Christ. That, that, that won't happen unless you receive Jesus Christ. This is exclusively for the believer. If you, if you like church, this is not just for people who like church. This is for people who love Jesus. This is for people who've given their lives to Jesus Christ, who've simply looked at themselves and recognized, I am a wretch undone, and it is impossible for me to fix myself. I'm done. I'm over with myself. I'm over me. But I want Christ to come into my life, be my Lord and Savior, and to make me over so that I can look like redeemed man and not just like fallen man. That's the option today. That's the choice today. And you know what? Through this word of God, you have free will. God has restored free will. He's given you choice today, but he's offering you life today. Choose life through Jesus Christ. Because I can promise you this. The person who doesn't believe is condemned already. I can promise you this, that there is a lake of fire that Satan is meant for Satan and his angels that is being enlarged every day for people who simply don't believe. And the gift of life simply comes with you receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And for you asking him to come into your life, to, to literally lead and guide your life by his spirit and to make you the new creation that he's promised. You do that, that that's, that's what's taken. And the Holy Spirit is going to lead you. And listen, we're going to be here. So if you're looking for a Bible-believing church, come on, continue to follow the Word of God. Continue to follow the Word of God. You know, I mean, if you want to learn and learn more about Him, listen, you can stay here with us because we're here every Thursday, every Sunday, every Wednesday. You follow the Word of God, but you need to hear the Word of God and continue to grow in the Word of God. But I'm excited for you because if you've made that confession today, if you've asked the Lord to come into your life, listen, Congratulations, brother and sister. You, listen, you are now a new creation in Christ. Because the Bible says if any man 
is actually in Christ, if you actually said that in your heart, old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. So I'm excited for you. And I'm excited for those believers that have heard this word today. That realize that you are not to live in the darkness. And you can't continue operating outside of his presence. But there's some stuff that has to be dealt with. That yeah, freedom. Yes, Satan is banished. But it doesn't mean that there aren't some consequences for your actions. And some accountability. And Adam will never realize who God is. And what God wants for him. Until he comes square and face with his own problems and says, Lord, it's me. That's the revelation today. Because God didn't come with a spear. And while you're worshiping out of his presence, it's not like he didn't know where Adam was. It's not like he couldn't have gone and gotten him right there. He's simply saying, come to me, all you all that are burdened and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That's the offer for the believer right now. Come to me with all those mental issues that you've got, with all those insecurities that you're working with. With all those things that you know, that you are fearful about, with all the lack of assurance that you feel in your spirit, even about yourself, come to me and give me those burdens and I'll give you rest. That's what the offer is today. And I hope that you receive that today. The word of God is blessed. My prayer is that you operate in the blessedness that is in this word today. And I just thank God for all your support in, in hearing. Listen, don't forget, we want you to share because I think that there's something in this message that the world needs to hear. And this can't be done by me alone, but we have a mandate as a church and as, as people of God to put get this word out as far and wide as we possibly can. So I need you to share the video. I need you to tell some people about this. Listen, if you get revelation here, I need you to minister some of this revelation because God's people need to know who they are. They need to know that there's a redemption plan that didn't start in their church. It didn't start on that Sunday morning. It didn't start on that Friday when they got it. it, it doesn't. It, it's not kept because of them, not kept because of their goodness. It's not still on them because of their kindness and gentleness. It's still because of the same grace that entered into people who simply never deserved it. And the day you think you deserve it, is the day that you're walking in pride. I bind that up right now. And I release right now in the atmosphere a spirit of gratitude. I hope you receive it because it's here. Listen, I thank God for you today. We're going to pray out today because I wanted to seal this with prayer. Thank God for each and every one of you all that are planting seed, those that are planting seed even now. I want you to know that I'm continually praying over your seed, that God will continue to multiply you for even for, for all that you give, no matter what it is. I, for words that you even send and, and things that you send me to compliment and to encourage me, I want you to know that I, I pray over those and I'm asking God that he would continue to bless you. And, and the way that he promised to bless, that if you just give a prophet a cool glass of water, he says that he'll give you a prophet's reward. I pray that you receive that. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you right now for your people. We thank you right now for the word that is going out. We know that it is life. And we thank you even right now, God, for the great sacrifice that you made on our behalf. We are not alone, that you will continue to be with us. And you said you'll never leave us or forsake us. But God, that there's a level of accountability we must take. That as we come out of darkness into light, we not only see you, but we see ourselves. And God, you've told us to come boldly before the throne asking what we will. So God, we just thank you right now as we repent over our own sins, as we look at ourselves and we see our own issues. God, we just thank you right now that we know that you said that we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of all those sins and, for, and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God, we know that there are even areas of ignorance that we are walking in that we don't even know. But we thank you right now for the blood that even covers our weaknesses and our infirmities, and that includes our ignorance. So God, we bless you. We thank you for power. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, leave this place and go out of here and power and be blessed today. God bless you.